Carolyn. On the rest of the mountain scene tonight, we'll take a look inside the world of pediatric medicine for all of the little people. We've got some community events, and Extension Agent Asel Kennedy has some information on the Beef Cattle Short Course, the Pennsylvania Farm Show, show and more. But right now, a lot of people fret because family doctors seem to be following blacksmiths into oblivion. His call flies Harold with a man who doesn't fret because he's found other ways to deliver health care. Carl? Thank you, Carolyn. Strategies for health care, especially primary care, the kind you used to visit your family doctor for, are much discussed lately. Some foresee a permanent shortage of family practitioners and recommend better emergency transportation, more use of paramedics, creation of health maintenance organizations, more osteopaths, and so on. Tonight, we'll talk to a man who's developed new strategies along some of these lines in northern West Virginia, Mike Ross, for 18 years, executive director of the Fairmont Clinic, a clinic with many coal miners and their families among its clientele. Mr. Ross, has the clinic been a success, and how does it work in a, in a way that would make it a little different from what people might be used to? The uh, Fairmont Clinic is an organized medical group practice with rural satellite offices and a six-county home health service so that it attempts to offer primary care and related necessary health care coverages to take care of the essential needs of people not only when they're ill, but uh, in maintaining good health. And what's the difference now between that and having a family doctor? Well, I think it's, uh, it's a version of the family doctor. Uh, the family doctor, unfortunately, has declined on the American scene. The growth of specialization has caused uh, many more doctors to be interested in the one inch around your eye or your ear, nose, and throat or some particular spot on your body or some particular disease entity or, or a function than in the you as a human being and your family. So that a family practitioner is difficult to find. And uh, it, it's a good effort uh, to try to uh, put on a group basis this opportunity so that in a clinic like uh, services such as we offer. The adults, the mother and father may be going to uh, a family practitioner or a specialist in adult medicine. The children may be going to a pediatrician. There may be support from a nurse practitioner or physician assistant caring for them in the absence of the physician or when the physician visit isn't necessary. And as necessary, general surgeons or eye specialists or other backup services are available. Now, now, does the organization you have allow uh, less medical personnel, say, to see more people? Is it more efficient in that way? I think the, the principal efficiency is in um, cutting down in the use of the hospital. The hospital is a combination of things. It's a motel where you get room and board. We have no room and board but we have about everything else that a hospital has. We have extensive range of medical services and of supporting services, x-ray laboratory, physical therapy, pulmonary function, and so forth. And in addition, we use supplements. We send visiting nurses and home health aides into six counties, way out into rural areas, and to elderly people at home. And this avoids hospitalization, which is the most expensive form of caring for people. And, and generally, you use a lot of paramedics, like the we, ones you've we, mentioned. I think we do, yes. We attempt to have a higher role for these people, and we believe in secondary level, like physician assistants and nurse practitioners, especially as necessary. So in the 18 years since you and I know the UMWA in its various arms played a role in starting the Fairmont Clinic, uh, what's been the area of, uh, I should say, the reaction of the medical establishment, let's call it, in this area? Uh, do, they, do they welcome some of these developments? 
Well, I think a portion of them do. Uh, certainly, uh, certain people right here in Morgantown, like Dr. Marshall and Chuck Sabo, were uh, very instrumental in, in support in the beginning. Uh, it would uh, be deceitful to not indicate that organized medicine in the form of a county medical society, unless it's under humane and progressive leadership, may tend, as it did in Marion County, to view any change with fear whether it's the election of President Roosevelt in 1936 or the development of a group practice or the Mayo Clinic, all of these things are sometimes viewed with fear. Uh, when that occurs, it's very unfortunate. It throws medicine behind, and uh, I often think the banner or the uh, plaque on the clinic ought to be a tribute to the Marion County Medical Society, which made Fairmont Clinic possible by going on strike against the coal miners so that... Uh, the mine workers program was forced to consider alternative systems for delivery of care. Well, now we're talking to you, I guess, on what is the occasion of your departure this month. You're involved in a $14 million grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to work developing uh, further models for rural health care delivery, and I think you'll teach a course uh, at a medical school about medical care organization all of this at the University of North Carolina. What's North Carolina got that West Virginia doesn't have? Well, I think each state has tremendous assets, and I, uh, I'm very much in love with West Virginia and its people and, and hills. Uh, what West Virginia lacks that North Carolina has is a progressive outlook in its university medical center, and I uh, don't apologize for saying that in the university's TV station. Uh, the catering to organized medicine by the top leadership in the University Medical Center has not advanced the human cause or the rural development of this state. If there's any reason for the deplorable development of a second medical school in a state that cannot decently support the one in Morgantown, it is caused by the failure on the part of the University Medical Center's leadership to face out and solve the problems the legislature wanted solved. Good services in rural areas and small towns instead of a med center which would be introverted and turned inside. Inside Morgantown, at the med center, are some very humane and decent department chairmen. But driven out of Morgantown were leading people like Dr. Nolan, who could have led in this direction and were forced to leave because of the reactionary catering to organized medicine, which really has no votes or doesn't have answers to the problems of West Virginia's health care needs. Let me ask you, uh, after that uh, somewhat, you know, terrifying description, whether things still seem to be moving in that direction. Do you have any cause for optimism in this regard? I don't recently? yet, but I, I hope the university will soon join North Carolina, Kentucky, Iowa, Minnesota, and other states in trying to have its university medical center deliver not solo practitioners and doctors who want to make a quarter of a million dollars, but doctors who respect the Hippocratic Oath, who want to join group practices, who want to deliver primary care out in the boondocks, and who want to join outfits like Fairmont Clinic, Farmington, Shinston, in delivering care. Right. We're very happy to have Yale and Harvard affiliations, by the way. We'd love to have them with Morgantown. Well, thank you very much for sharing your views. We've been talking to Mr. Michael Ross, the executive director of the Fairmont Clinic, and uh, on the occasion of his move to North Carolina. Thank you. There are some varied events coming up, and all emphasizing West Virginia. In Morgantown tomorrow night... My name is David Oliver. Most of my friends call me Jack, and I am a native West Virginian. For the past 28 years, I have made my home in Carlsbad, New Mexico, working as a potash miner. For the benefit of those that are not familiar with potash, its principal use is fertilizer. You know, that's the stuff you put on the ground, you spread it all around, you dig it with a hole, and it makes the flowers grow. It's also good for vegetables, too.
I know there's some union people in this audience tonight that knows the rest of this little ditty, so I'll cut her off while I'm ahead. First, I want to apologize for not being able to attend this great event in person. But since I'm not a big wheel in the company I work for, they tell me when I can have off. Secondly, I want to thank those responsible for the invitation to this great occasion. I certainly appreciate it very much. I want to begin by saying that Mike Ross is a very close personal friend of mine and one of the greatest men and humanitarians that I have ever known. We here in the Southwest have great admiration and respect for him. <clears throat> I would like to share a little part of Mike's past life with you tonight, if I may. I hope Mike doesn't mind. But I merely want to point out that this guy was making a great contribution to mankind 25 years ago. And Lord knows how long before that. But I bet there's some people here in the audience tonight that could tell you. That was in the early 1950s when Mike and his family came into our lives in Carlsbad, New Mexico. Mike was an international representative for my mill smelter workers. Came out of the deep south to call the bed to an impossible assignment. You see, the problem was that we had lost a long and bitter strike. in 1950. And we hadn't been able to recuperate. The companies had a kind of laid on us, and we were still licking in wounds, so to speak. It didn't take Mike long to assess the situation. He took the bull by horns, and before we knew it, he had us hopping around like a cat on a hot griddle. First, he got all the necessary committees active, so we could be effective in the area of uh, grievances, arbitration cases, negotiations on collective bargaining. Then he went to work on a publishing newspaper called Potash Dust. Now our local union sponsored it. Now the companies controlled a newspaper called the Current Argus. Us union people call it current anguish. Anyway, Mike took took them to task as they had played a major role in the breaking our strike and they had managed to get public opinion on their side. Mike took that little potash dust and he really tore him up. No time at all. He had the public on our side. Now, the companies didn't like that at all. Mike and his family started getting threatening phone calls and harassment of other nature. But that didn't stop Mike. So you know what they did? You guessed it. They burned their union hall down. I mean, plumb to the ground. But that didn't stop Mike because he had it rebuilt. And we have one of the nicest union halls in the whole Southwest right today. And Mike Ross is responsible. And it stands as a monument to Mike. To Mike's great dedication to the labor movement in the Southway, in the Southwest. Just as the Fairmont Clinic will stand as a great monument to him in group practice and health services throughout the great Appalachian area. I'm going to wind this up. I could talk from now on about Mike and different instances that happened while he was with us in a few years he was here in the Southwest. I want you to know him as we know him as a warm, 
compassionate, kind, and understanding person. And one of the best and fastest organizers that ever hit the West. And as you all know him here in Fairmont, he's one of the best administrators that ever hit the East. In closing, I have a little quotation that you all have probably heard at one time or another. Every time I hear it or read it, I think of Mike Ross, because I think this is a philosophy that he lives by, or he lives by. Quote, I shall pass through this world but once. If therefore there be any good thing I can do, let me do it now. Mike, good luck in your future endeavors. I hope to see you soon. And as we say in the southwest down here on the Mexico border, Adios, amigos.